Hi, welcome to my podcast, and I'm happy to have my first guest to my very first episode of Eye to Eye podcast, Dr. Boyan Kozamara, PhD. Dr. Kozamara is the co-owner as well as medical director in Svetlast Eye Clinic in Banja Luka from Bosnia, Herzegovina. He is mainly an anterior segment surgeon as well as a specialist in cataract and refractive surgeries. He did a lot of publications and continues his scientific work up to date. Yeah, very good. So I want to start, as I told you already in the mail, about with the LASIK correction and refractive surgeries, uh, intraocular and extraocular. By extraocular, I uh, mean the corneal refractive surgeries. So just a few days ago, I came along across one article um, where they compared FS LASIK with ICL for myopic patients. And mm -hmm. in order to be more specific, it's like a highly myopic patients. Mm -hmm. And I know that you also, uh, you're very tend to do myopic corrections with ICLs, mm -hmm. right? And do you have your own specific opinion why you would like to do that? Or should I be always uh, more specific in, with ICL refractive surgeries because this is mainly for high myops? What is your point about that? Well, I will, I will start with the fact that my eyes were operated on back in 2009. I had minus nine on my right eye and minus five on my left eye. If mm -hmm. I was to choose or if I had a chance to, to, to choose between the ICL, between the vision ICL that we have right now and LASIK, I would most definitely choose the ICL. Why? Because um, with the high myopic ablations, you have very deep ablations and you will most definitely have post-operative uh, dry eye in mainly or all the patients that you operate on. So I, I had for a very long time a uh, dry eye on my right eye where I had uh, minus nine. The other issue is that you will have to touch uh, too much of the cornea. You will, you will have to remove too much of the corneal uh, stroma. And by that fact, you, will, you may have post-operative post uh, co uh, complications, as I, as I just said. Also, you may have an unsatisfied patient. With the ICL lens, you will be able to remove the lens if the if the patient is unsatisfied and you will have and you will not touch the cornea that much mm -hmm. so you may reduce the number of post operative un uh, satisfaction that patients may have okay so did you have this dry eye symptoms in general dry eye kind of condition before the surgery Oh, you uh, basically, no, Maybe because I, mm -hmm. I did wear uh, contacts for a very, very long time since, mm -hmm. since I was eight. Uh, okay. But I did not have that much of a dry eye right after the uh, LASIK. Uh, I had a severe dry eye after the uh, LASIK, mostly on my right eye. I think it is, it is because the uh, LASIK ab ablation was big was actually mm -hmm. and my uh, corneal uh, nerves could not recover that mm -hmm. much as as they did on my left eye mm -hmm. and what would be your maximum age range when you would say that okay until that time i would consider for high myops icls after that i would not do that well do you uh, have this kind of nomogram for yourself no, I, I, I choose that uh, from, from one patient to, to the other because mm -hmm. I think that uh, there is no uh, specific, uh, let's call it a rule, that, that you can have for each and every uh, patient because you may have uh, patients that, that have a high myopia and they do not want to do uh lasik whatsoever you all you all you also mm -hmm. have those that would like to do only lasik and they do not want to have any type of intraocular 
implants. Uh, so what I what I do is that I talk to the patients. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot to the patients. I want to learn as much as I can about what they want, what they want to um, achieve, uh, what they expect, and what can I do for them after I examine them. Uh, I would not do fake intraocular lenses after the age of 40 to uh, mm -hmm. 40 because these these patients in a three to five uh, years will have a press biopia and uh, having the ICL in in their eye will not have that much of the effect uh, and I will not do it before the age of 18 to 21. Uh, before 18 to 21 mm -hmm. okay you have partially answered actually my question um when i wanted to ask that for example if you would have a patient high myop and based on the examination and also the pupil size this is also another thing which i want so want to uh touch so when you would say that okay the pupil size of a patient is large and maybe in this particular case it's better for this patient to have ICL, but the patient has a fear to have intraocular surgery and tends to have LASIK surgery. So I, I believe that, of course, communication and explanation is very important. But how to, to be with these kind of patients? Or you just decide to take a larger optic zone in order to avoid any kind I of I usually do that, yes. I, I usually do that, and it also uh, depends on the level of uh, visual uh, acuity that they have. So if you have an amblyopic patient, mm -hmm. which has, for example, minus six or uh, minus seven diopters of sphere, and they have very large uh, pupils, maybe six millimeters or even... Yeah. Uh, larger than that, they would most definitely benefit from from the LASIK, even though they have so much uh, larger pupils, because they are amblyopic and they will not see any uh, glare halos as would do all those that that have 1.0 uh, VA or uh, 2020, as we, as we mm -hmm. also call. Uh, mm -hmm. It also depends on what patients do. If they uh, mm -hmm. are in their cars a lot, if they uh, drive by night a lot, I would mm -hmm. I would not do uh, LASIK. I would most definitely uh, try to get them into the ICL lenses. Mm -hmm. So there is an opinion that ICL has a very good potential to substitute FS LASIK or in general current refractive surgeries due to high optical and visual quality of ICL implantation. Do you think uh, this is because of direct intervening in the optical system, that we directly intervene in the optical system by implanting uh, the lens behind the pupil, because pupil is also an important part of optics in the eye. So do you in general think that there might be slowly a tendency when these LASIK surgeries will be substituted with intraocular? Uh, lenses implantation. Uh, well, uh, it is it is the uh, it is the same thing as if you have the patient who wears glasses and and who would like to wear um, contacts. So mm -hmm. uh, when you have the patients that, for example, have minus two and you put them uh, minus two uh, glasses on, they will they will see you know like great. But when you put minus two contacts on their eyes, they will tell you that they see excellent because mm -hmm. the uh, contact lens comes directly onto the eye or onto the cornea and uh, they imitate the normal vision of the eye. So uh, you will not, you will have much uh, larger uh, visual field. You will feel as if, as if there is uh, nothing uh, around your eyes that uh, blocks your vision. So I think it it is the same thing as with the uh, LASIK comparing it to the ICL. Also, you reshape the cornea with the uh, FS LASIK or, or any yeah. type um, uh, PRK or 
LASIK that uh, you will do, which basically thinks uh, or means that you will change the HOA or HOA mm -hmm. or uh, higher order aberrations. And you will also change the uh, quality of vision that uh, one patient sees. However, that is not uh, as important to high myopic patients as it is for, uh, for example, uh, hyperopic patients, which are used to see very good at far, but they cannot see good at near. So uh, when you when you reshape the uh, cornea in uh, uh, hyperopic patients, they will most definitely see some some or have some type of uh, photic phenomena, glare or or uh, halo, and most of them will be very unsatisfied. So mm -hmm. I think that maybe in the near future, LASIK will will be only done to myopic patients. They uh, mm -hmm. may only also be, be done for patients with uh, low to mid astigmatism. I don't think that we will do it much more in, in, in higher astigmatism. By that, I mean higher than minus three or minus mm -hmm. four doctors. I don't think that it, it will be done that much for um, hyperopic patients. And I think that we need to find a totally new way to correct uh, hyperopia for very young patients. By young, I mean those from the age of uh, 20 to 21 until the age of uh, 40 to 45. Yes, you already uh, answered my question when I asked about the pupil. And uh, but in general, if I miss something, so what would be the your range of pupil size when you would say that this particular patient is not gonna have FS LASIK because of I don't know large pupil. For the pupil size, if you if you are asking for myopic patients, I would not do them. And, and if they have a uh, twenty twenty vision. I mm -hmm. would not do uh, FS LASIK for those patients where where uh, the pupil size in scotopic conditions is larger than 4.5 to 5 millimeters. So mm -hmm. uh, each and every time we we do uh, pentacam mm -hmm. exam, uh, we always do it for uh, LASIK or laser patients in scotopic conditions. Uh, conditions because I want to see how much will that pupil uh, enlarge if my patient is in the car and he's on a highway uh, <laughs> and and it's uh, middle of the night and I want to see if if he or she will come uh, back to me in a couple of months and say I cannot see anything uh, mm -hmm. uh, at night when i'm in my car so uh for four four to four point four point five or maybe even five would be the 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 highest uh level of pupil dilation that i would take for uh fs lasik however if you have an amblyop patient which sees maybe 2060 or um uh, 2080 uh they want to improve their vision on that eye or on uh, both of their eyes I would I would consider them uh, if they have uh, pupils that are larger than 5.0 mm -hmm. so of course as I understood and uh, as I also believe that it's very important to ask the style of patient's life what is that he is doing I'm yeah. for multifocal lenses, for EDOFs, for ICLs, for uh, LASIKs. You have to talk to the patients, and that's the primary thing that you need to do. Uh, yeah. All the rest of the stuff comes second, if they have mm -hmm. or, they, or they do not have healthy eyes. Uh, what is the size of the AC, AC depth? Uh, what is the pachymetry? Mm -hmm. all other things but um the only issue that you need you need to talk to the patients and and you need to see uh what they do how they do it where they live how they live 
um, uh, I, I, I actually had a guy who was a uh, driver for our minister here. And, mm -hmm. and he could only see uh, 2080 and 20 over, <laughs> over 100 on, on uh, both of his eyes. Uh, and I asked him, how do you see? Uh, and he said the, the minister does not take any uh, night uh, drives. He does not have any night meetings. And, uh, oh. and uh, when is the daylight, I see excellent. But uh, during the night, I cannot see anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. it is very important for you to talk to the patients yeah. uh, and the patient and to see what they want, how they want it, what they want to achieve. Uh, uh, and you need to explain to the basic details each and everything that, that they can expect. So uh, when I do this, I tend to, to uh, show to the patients the worst case scenario every time. I mm -hmm. will not tell them that the surgery uh, will be perfect, that they will see perfectly, that they will not experience anything. I want them to understand that uh, they can have some side effects and that they the and that these side effects can affect their lives. Mm -hmm. Yes, I also believe that it's very important. And do you uh, have a routine to check the dry eye symptoms, even if the patient doesn't have any complaints? Do you do any tests, dry eye tests pre before the surgery? Yes, pre-operatively to each and every patient that uh, comes to us that uh, wants to do either LASIK or uh, intraocular lens implantation, we do Schirmer tests. Mm -hmm. uh, and according to that, if the level of um, of uh, tears is less than 10 uh, millimeters, we do not do surgery. So uh, um, if we see that patient has some inflammation or that we can uh, get it uh, much or less better than it is, then we uh, put them onto the uh, medication drops and we mm -hmm. see him month or a month and a half mm -hmm. so the the results of shimmer tests basically decide also yes. at some point if you're gonna do surgeries or not yes. do you do this kind of specific approach for everybody or do you also differentiate between men and women because i have the feeling that women have somehow more tendency to have dry eye syndrome is it um I actually Did you do something like that too? We actually do it to all of our uh, all of our patients, regardless of their uh, sex, gender. Uh, but maybe we can see uh, that women are more prone to mm -hmm. developing uh, dry eyes after the uh, procedure than we do see them uh -huh. uh, before mm -hmm. that. Why is that? Particularly, or maybe due to the hormones that mm -hmm. uh, women have and we males do not have it at least not at, at uh, that level and I think that those hormonal uh, levels may affect the development of dry eye. Uh, we should or we should do that uh, in each and every patient. We should again talk to them and explain to them that they may be uh, connected to those small uh, small bottles of uh, <laughs> artificial tears for a very for a very very uh, long time I was um, dependent on them for uh, about a year after my eyes were operated on mm -hmm. I see so now just a short uh, information about myself because I have extremely dry eye and uh, I have just a very small amount of astigmatism but uh, I'm afraid to have any LASIK surgeries because I'm kind of sure that after the surgery I'm gonna have it even worse because without drops 
there is no day for me. I yeah. drop them every single day, twice in a day. And yeah, when I don't drop them, I realize that I have dry eye. I don't know, maybe also because we are constantly watching something or just reading from the screen. Of course, this is this lifestyle right. also affects a lot. So what do you think? I mean, <laughs> do you think I should consider it or it's better not? Well, uh, you know what? I am um, um, each and every refractive surgery is basically elective. So you mm -hmm. can do it or you can't do it. You uh, wish to do it or you do not uh, have to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I wouldn't have uh, do it right now. I wouldn't have risk it. If you still mm -hmm. feel that, that you have uh, extremely dry eyes and you basically uh, did anything you could to uh, make it better. I don't know if you ever tried uh in germany or in austria it is called e e e curvis or e curvis e or, curvis. Uh, yes, yes. E curvis. no i a, never tried it for an a uh mm -hmm. it is very good for people like you who uh did uh, try everything they basically could i think you take it for uh 20 days two to three times per day continuing and, and taking uh, artificial tears, and you can see if you will have any benefit with those mm -hmm. uh, eye drops. Okay. Um, you cannot do anything uh, wrong to your eyes. But at this level, with so small level of astigmatism, I would not do it. I mean, it's okay. I Of course, with glasses, I see better, yeah. but yeah. So <laughs> let's continue. Sure. So um, then uh, I want to continue with the FS LASIK uh, versus uh, microkeratoms. And I think you are using microkeratoms, right? Mostly, yes. Mostly, yes. Mostly, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I will start with first question. So the literature review indicates that the femtosecond laser has a tendency to create a slightly thicker flap than intended, while microkeratom, uh, the flap, uh, while with microkeratom, the flap is thinner than intended. Did you hear something about that? And what are your thoughts in general? It is basically true because when a femtosecond laser uh, cuts the flap, it cuts mm -hmm. it evenly. Uh, when microkeratom uh, does it, it does it like this. Uh, but uh, femtosecond laser for many nations and for many countries and, and for many people is more expensive and people here, at least where I live, cannot afford femtosecond uh, laser LASIK because it would cost too much for most of them. So uh, I did not see much of a difference post-operatively between the uh, FS and the micro uh, keratom LASIK. I could have chosen back in 2009 between the two, and I chose uh, micro keratom for both of my eyes because uh, if you, if you uh, take the, the time that the suction ring is onto the eye, in mm -hmm. uh, femtosecond laser, your patient has to be still and lie still for uh, 22, 25 seconds per eye. In microkeratom, I do the flap in 6 to 10 seconds. So if you have a patient which is much more scared, uh, has small eyes, has deeply set eyes, it is much easier for me to do micro uh, microkeratom flap than to do the FS flap. The other uh, thing is that uh, you need to move patients. So if you if you have uh, a laser uh, platform where you have both uh, lasers in 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 one setting, you will have to move the bed from uh, this side here to uh, the other side here. For mm -hmm. many patients, any movement that you do yeah. is yeah. scary. Uh -huh. uh, Third thing is that you have to do four uh, procedures in one patient. So you uh, have to do FS 
flap on this yeah. side and then on the other eye and then you have to move the patient as i said and then you have to lift the flap do the ablation on uh, right eye and then uh, again do the same thing on to the left eye for many patients that is too much uh, mm -hmm. and i don't think as as in what is called now flax or femto laser assisted cataract surgery uh, many many nations now see that there is no much bigger uh, benefit in doing fs comparing to uh, phaco or micro keratom lasik uh, i think that the the only issue that we will have with uh, micro keratoms is that the uh, industry will will stop making those micro uh, mm. uh, keratom blades and we will not be able to uh, buy them, meaning that we will not be able to do micro keratom LASIK anymore. Oh, really? Do, do you really believe that? I mm -hmm. think so. Uh, the same thing they, they uh, did with uh, FACO machines. If you, if you take any company, they basically make you to buy a new machine after 10 to 15 years because they, they, they stop producing those uh those uh, uh what we call bags or or mm -hmm. uh uh systems for for uh uh probes mm -hmm. okay interesting because there are publications it was actually a new one from 2021 uh from someone um they compared fs lasik with microkeratoms and udva or anything didn't show any significant differences no. No. Uh, exactly. And even though some doctors, they still believe in the superiority of FS LASIK over microkeratoms, the superiority, let's say, like that was not proved. It's just a subjective opinion of doctors. I, and I, I, mean, I respect uh, all the colleagues that, that uh, do FS only, but I don't see how. The only issue is that you will have much less uh, complications with the with the flap if you use fs comparing to a micro uh, keratom lasik because if the suction breaks in in fs you can re uh, suction the eye and the laser will continue where it stopped in micro keratom it is not possible you mm -hmm. will have to re position the flap and you will have to make to wait a month or month and a half and then do the new cut it is true but all the rest of the things i don't see how fs uh benefits more than micro keratin lasik uh and on the other side uh if you want to do one fs uh procedure you need to pay uh what we call the license or the password to 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 use the machine which for us costs two thousand euros to uh excuse me two hundred euros per patient mm -hmm. uh where in in micro keratin you can buy one uh blade for 45 euros okay yeah and what is the thickness of uh, the flap with micro keratin which you um, so i do it basically for 90 uh, 90 uh, 90, micro, wow. 90 to uh, 100 you uh, you also have knives that will cut one uh, 30 to 140 microns mm -hmm. because the in the publication which i've read they said that there is also a difference between flaps and obviously which you already also before mentioned that in micro keratoms they they make like a meniscus shaped yes. flap yes and uh, it's more homogeneous let's say like that in right. fs lasik yes and um, it was also mentioned there because they evaluated all these flaps shapes post-operatively that this the thicker the flap of microkeratoms the more meniscus kind of shape it has so okay. with 110 between 100 and 110 they have a less tendency to have it in this meniscus kind of and 130 is more and as you said, also 140. That's so, because mm -hmm. you are taking much more stromal tissue. tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you if you uh, look at the cornea, they made the 
knives uh, for uh, 90 to uh, 100 micron flaps not to go that deep. And mm -hmm. they have to cut it like, like this. But yeah. as, as soon as you go deeper into the cornea, you will have much more tissue. And they made it to go like this. Yeah, it's like that's, a safety, basically. That's why, yeah, yeah, that's why the meniscus is much, uh, let's call it bigger, thicker, in mm -hmm. in those um, that are cutting 130 to 140 microns. Mm -hmm. Do you do you have as a standard for everybody 100 uh, or 90, as you said, micron, or do you adjust it also based on the cornea refraction or thickness? I adjusted basically uh, for each and every patient. Uh, mainly mm -hmm. in 90 to 95 percent, I do uh, a hundred microns thickness flap. So these are the uh, those that are 90 to a hundred microns. If mm -hmm. I have a patient uh, or or a patient that has a very thick cornea and has very low refractive error, for example, minus one or minus 1.5. I would then use um, 130 to 140 microns flaps. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, did you have in general the feeling, because there was another publication, they compared the outcomes, uh, even though the UCDVA was not significantly different in any of the groups, I mean, FS LASIK or microkeratoms, but I don't know, they identified that the patients in the microkeratoms LASIK group had more tendency to have a myopic post-LASIK refraction. Did you see something like that in your practice? No. no. If, you, if you use the right nomograms mm -hmm. uh, for each and, and every patient, I don't, I don't uh, remember exactly, but I know that you do not uh, change uh, the, uh, the 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 amount of refraction that that you will correct from minus two to minus five after the minus five you uh subtract minus 0 0.5 from minus six to one uh, to minus seven i think it's minus one from minus uh seven to minus eight it's minus 1.25 and from minus eight to minus nine it's i think one uh minus 1.5 but uh, if you do the nomograms correctly and you have the whole patient's eye in front of you and you analyze the corneal topography, I don't think that you will be able to, to, to make a myopic shift. However, mm -hmm. I had a very large number of patients whom I corrected uh, hyperopia. Mm -hmm. Uh, mostly those from plus three to 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 plus four plus four point five, who mm -hmm. ended up myopic, uh, okay. and I basically I basically stopped doing uh, LASIK for or for all uh, hyperopic patients uh, uh, from plus three to plus five because many of them, if not any of them, will end up uh, myopic, which for them is a Disaster. Disaster. I, I realize that many surgeons are really hesitating uh, correcting hyperops. I mean, when it comes to this super, uh, this uh, corneal refractive told, I, I did it back in 2008, 9, 10, uh, up to 2015. I corrected hyper, or I did uh, hyperopic LASIK up to plus, plus five or plus 5.5. .5. Then I saw that many of them will end up, as I said, myopic, uh, and I lowered it to plus four. Then mm -hmm. I saw again that many of them have halos glare, and they uh, turn myopic in a couple of years. And now I do it only uh, when I have to, and up to plus two point five to plus four, uh, to plus four. And 0.275. I do not do it for 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 high hyperops. Hyperops. Anymore. So basically, if for example, 36 years old patient comes to you and he's hyperop uh, since forever, and uh, 
he asks you about refractive surgery. Would you just consider, and he really desperately wants to have this, would you just consider an intraocular lens or nothing? When somebody desperately wants to do uh, that kind of thing to their eyes, uh, send them back. <laughs> okay. uh, because, yeah, because those, those patients will never be satisfied. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, avoid patients that seek perfection. Yeah. Because they will never be perfect and they will mm -hmm. never be satisfied and they will never see and they will always have something with their eyes. Um, I would, uh, depending on the, on the level of uh, hyperopia that the patient has, uh, if he's a high hyperope, plus five, six, seven, eight, maybe ten even, mm -hmm. I would suggest them to do uh, EDOF. Uh, or EDOF mm -hmm. lenses, because those 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 patients basically do not have accommodation anymore. Yeah. Even though they are uh, at the age of uh, 36, right? Uh, they do not have, or they lost their accommodation for a very very long time. They may be amblyopic, which mm -hmm. uh, means that I will not put the uh, multifocal uh, intraocular lenses into their eyes because they will always be un satisfied yeah uh, or if they see good uh, and they have plus three plus two plus four i would tell them to wait for a couple more uh couple of more years and then i would i would do either the edof or the multi-focal lens implantation mm -hmm. so basically this would all you also consider for presbyopic patients too Yes, yes. If I have if I have a patient or a patient that is 46, 47, 45, mm -hmm. uh, they have plus 0.5 for uh, far vision and they developed uh, 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 presbyopia, I would suggest them either to do the EDOF lenses or the multifocal lenses. Mm -hmm. Do you do before multifocal lenses implantations any tests? If because I I heard that uh, there are some patients who cannot still uh, adjust to this multifocality of lenses. Uh, that is not actually this? true. Um, okay, okay. I do the same exams as I do for any LASIK patient, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what I basically do is I talk to these patients a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to see how crazy they are <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah and what they want to do uh with their eyes what they expect if i have a patient who uh comes to me and he or she says i want to see as i saw when i was uh, uh 25 i uh, mm -hmm. send them back home because those patients will never be satisfied i need yeah. to I need them to understand what are the limitations of these intraocular lenses. So uh, for diffractive multifocal intraocular lenses, I always say that they may have halos glare, particularly uh, during the night. Mm -hmm. So if they are in their cars and the other car uh, comes uh, in the opposite direction, they may see halos glare or starbursts. If they are not using their car uh, during the night that much, they may be a good candidates for uh, diffractive multifocal intraocular lenses. For the newest uh, lenses that I use, Synergy lenses, mm -hmm. I also uh, tell them that they may have a little bit of drop of contrast uh, sensitivity. Their uh, colors will be the same as they were, but they may see them a little bit grayer than they did before. Uh, if I have a younger patient, a uh, patient who is a professional driver, who uh, drives uh, during the night, I would suggest to him or her most uh, definitely to use the EDOF lenses because they will not have that many or even if any uh, uh, halos and glare and they do not uh, read that much those small letters so they would be most definitely satisfied with the EDO lenses.
But mm -hmm. what I do, I talk to, to, to them a lot. I show yeah. a lot of photos. Um, I want them to understand that their, their uh, vision will, will not be perfect, but they have to know that it may be much, much better uh, than it is as it is at that specific moment. This is great. Of course, I am sure you have a great experience in this multifocal lenses. Maybe we'll cover this in sure. our next videos. I would love to do that because it's, I think, a huge topic to cover. It is. Um, yeah. So let's continue with the and go back to microkeratoms and FS LASIK. So another study showed that also uh, there is also a progressive thickening of the flap of the LASIK over time in high pre-op myopic patients. And it was also correlated with the level of corrected spherical refractive error. So for every diopter of spherical equivalent corrected, 1.15 micron epithelial thickening was observed. Did, did you hear something like that? And this was like the first three months after LASIK. Well, um, I'm not sure if maybe... It is. I, I I did not look into that specific study, mm -hmm. but um, if you take the cornea, you lift the flap, and you do the ablation uh, on the stroma. Stroma. You mm -hmm. reposition the flap, and uh, that type that that my micronic uh, part of the tissue that you moved is not there anymore. So this cornea down there has to reconnect with this one, which is upwards. You will always have a um, water or BSS that, yeah. that will stay in, in uh, that specific area. So what the eye does, it most uh, definitely grows a bit of the tissue to fill that, that specific void that we have uh, right now, uh, you you do not see that the cornea is maybe it is a bit uh, flattened than it uh, than it was, but I think that these two parts re uh, connect into their own way. Uh, I believe that I did not do any uh, study of that kind, but I believe that there may be. Uh, tissue growing or tissue thickening maybe from uh, stroma uh, toward the part of the cornea or the epithelium together with the uh, Bowman layer where the where the flat is. So what would make you in your practice post-operatively to measure the thickness of the flap? Did you have any uh, this kind of situation actually when you think, okay, I would like to know what is the thickness of the flap now, even though that you know that before it was tended to be 90 or 100? Well, um, we, my uh, colleagues from Croatia, from our main uh, hospital there did a study I think it was back in 2017 or, or 2018. And they've measured the thickness of the flaps. And they ended up mm -hmm. seeing that uh, microkeratom flaps were from uh, 90 to uh, 105 microns. And the FS were exactly 100 to 102 uh, microns. Uh, meaning that it is true that FS uh, flaps are much more precise as mm -hmm. they as you uh, set the laser machine on them. But in patient's view or in our uh, view, it does not make any big difference. So the, the main issue is if the patient will see uh, good or great or better after the uh, LASIK, regardless if it's a FS LASIK or microkeratom LASIK. And on the other hand, you, you need to see uh, what is their VA. If a uh, minus mm -hmm. 5 patient can now see 2020 or 2025 20, uh, uh, after the LASIK, it is an excellent choice for, for them. I do not uh, seek for uh, 
perfection in all these patients because you will never find it. Yeah. You can always find something that will not be good. When yes. you touch the cornea, you will have higher HOAs in each and every patient. You cannot miss that. If you, if you do the um, uh, ICL, in a couple of years, you may have a certain level of uh, cataract. Uh, you, you will have a patient that, that will tell you that their vision is not that good as it, as it was before. But the only issue that you uh, need to see is if your patient will see better or not. And you have yeah. to find the right way the right and the right mechanism to uh, make it happen. Actually, we also covered this a bit, but uh, I will still ask you. So I believe each method has its own complications and advantages. I mean, FS LASIK or uh, microkeratome. But there is still no evidence for inequality or superiority, how I said, of either of the technique. But my personal feeling is that somehow femtosecond laser is like fancier, let's say like that, in the ophthalmological world, even though there is no differences of the results, outcome, as, as, and as you said, patient didn't even realize. But what, what, what kind of car do you have? I, what kind of I, car? Yes, I have Renault Captur. <laughs> Excellent. If you, if you take it with the basic equipment in it and if you take it a full high leather air conditioning stuff it will still be the same car right yes and i am not into car i no, even don't you, like driving honestly yeah i mean uh, uh, uh you now have um you now have uh, colleagues in the united states i actually talked to one of them uh, a couple of days ago and mm -hmm. the issue was the femtos uh, laser assisted cataract surgery. Many of them are uh, leaving that concept because yeah. it's very expensive. It takes too much time to time. do. And Absolutely. the patient did not see much benefit of it. Okay, if, yeah. you, if you had a patient who, who, who has a smaller level of astigmatism and you can do the LRIs um, mm -hmm. the, uh, limbal relaxing in, 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 in onto the cornea when the femto laser does it it's much you know like better as if I mm -hmm. uh, do it uh, by my hand but the regular FACO it is much faster you know uh, what you are doing. You will still do the whole the whole surgery by yourself, and you still have to do the most of the surgery by yourself if you do the FS uh, FS cataract surgery, um, and the patients cannot aff afford it. It is yes, much it's more extremely expensive, expensive yeah. than it is to do a uh, usual regular fake. So I I I think that the Industry will 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 um, affect it, right? Take us by by our necks, and they will <laughs> use it because they will force us to buy the uh, femto lasers, the uh, femto phaco lasers, uh, because they will stop pro uh, producing uh, the uh, micro uh, keratom blades and micro keratoms as well, and you will not be able to. Uh, by them. For ex example, I would like to find a guy who will tell me the big difference. Of course, there are uh, small of them, but I will. I would like to find a um, colleague surgeon who will uh, tell me the big differences between the Centurion uh, Alcon uh, Faco and the Infinity Faco that uh, that we had before that. I don't see any. Mm -hmm. I don't see any, but you cannot buy those uh, cassettes that we use. Those yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, systems that uh, that we use for infinity anymore, and you are forced to buy the new Faco uh, Faco machine. So uh, those benefits that they talked about are not that high and not that big as we thought they would be.
Yeah, so basically, no matter what doctors find easier or more practic, the industry somehow affects the demand. Definitely, because the same uh, the same price for FS uh, laser is for me as it is for the guy in, for example, Vienna. Uh, maybe yeah. the patients in uh, Vienna can pay two thousand euros per eye for a FS. Uh, FS uh, LASIK patients in Bosnia cannot pay uh, that much. We will have to find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you uh, see that the license cost, the cost for me to uh, turn the uh, FS on and to uh, work with it is not the same for me because I have less size as it is for the guy from, for example, Boston, who has 10 to uh, 100 times more eyes than I do. Uh, I cannot uh, compete with him and have the same machine, the FS, uh, and give the lower, lower, uh, uh, lower price for my patients as he can take it up for uh, uh, his patients. So I uh, again I think that we need to find ourselves somewhere in the middle. Um, yeah. FS is excellent; it is great, but you need to know that uh, certain eyes or certain countries cannot use it that much uh, as some others can. I think there are also many doctors involved in this uh, technology development projects uh, when it comes to to doctors and the and the and the industry uh you can remember the last year's covid vac vaccination and uh, we had an issue where it it actually said that uh pfizer made their vaccine in uh, about a year yeah uh, you and you and I know that takes five to ten years to test that that same vaccine and to see how it uh, affects people. But we were totally we as a doctors were basically totally out of it. Uh, things move fast. Uh, things move yeah. much faster than uh, than they were. I think that we as a doctors need to find totally new testing models for 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 the new technology because we cannot test each and every uh, thing that comes out onto our uh, patient's eyes. We need to find some other uh, things, maybe some kind of a softwares or, or, or some poor guys or whatever, uh, because it takes too much time and the industry does not like when something takes too yeah. much time. They want it fast they want it hard and they want to in the next two three five years have a totally new issue that they will put into us or they will put in front of us and uh tell us okay this is the newest the best and you will make much more uh with this as you did with the other one do you do prk uh between five to six percent of my myopic patients yes Mm -hmm. So, what makes you decide to do PRK? Because I also know many well, surgeons who do only PRK. They do, don't do do any flaps. Many, many surgeons do not like to um, cut cornea. Yeah. And many surgeons are afraid to cut cornea. Uh, when you do the uh, PRK, um, you can do it up to minus four. You can do it uh, up to uh, 1.5 diopters of astigmatism. Mm -hmm. And you will have patients who will recover for more than a week. Uh, I tend to do PRK only for those patients who are not uh, good candidates for LASIK, who have uh, very thin corneas. Uh, and for the patients who are willing to sacrifice 7 to 10 days of their of their lives 
to lay back home and feel pain and feel itchiness in uh, both of their eyes. So uh, those are basically the patients that are not good uh, candidates for LASIK and they, they do not want to do the ICL. What would be your advice for young, just starting surgeons, surgeons in LASIK field? What, what would you advise you? So what is, when you look back now, when you just started LASIK procedures, what you would well, do different? <clears throat> go slow. Uh, choose as, as much mentors or have as much mentors as you can. Uh, do not uh, trust 100% the industry. Find your own way, find your own style, find your own machines or intraocular uh, lenses that you will use. Uh, see what patients need see what patients can have, see what can, what uh, patients can pay. Uh, do not rush into a groups of, 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 of people they, that uh, think the same. You have to be that specific person, that specific doctor, and you have to do it in your own way. Thank you so much. <laughs>